morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here today for week one's webinar. Uh, we have seen all the participation you have done during this week's content, um, and we're really excited to have you in this webinar that will complement a lot of the content that um, a lot of the content you have interacted with already during this specific week. And today we are joined by an absolutely amazing cybersecurity professional that I'm very proud to introduce. Uh, that is Mr. Lawrence Mushilo. And um, Lawrence is a highly experienced cybersecurity professional and executive with nearly a decade of experience in helping companies develop and improve their information security programs, compliance and risk management. He specializes in digital forensics, the creation of national SART, risk and compliance management, uh, cybersecurity operation centers and incident response. He is passionate about security and has a wealth of experience in governance, leadership, collaboration and product management. Currently, he leads the information security department at a large multinational organization where he oversees the risk and compliance teams. Additionally, he is the co-founder of B-Sides Nairobi. I have the pleasure of introducing Mr. Lawrence. Uh, please take it away. Wow, 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 wow. Patricia, you do such an amazing job uh, introducing uh, our trainers, specifically, in this case, me. Wow. I think I should probably borrow whatever script you are using for my own uh, future introduction. Thank you so much. Uh, very happy to be here. As uh, Patricia mentioned, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who uh, is uh, with us in this call and uh, wherever you are joining from. I'm hoping that uh, today we are going to have a, well, most an amazing next hour or so. And well, at it, you're also going to learn uh, a few interesting topics as far as advanced cybersecurity attacks in online, uh, learning, uh, online learning is concerned. Uh, and this knowledge is hopefully going to help you as an individual, as a teacher educator, to improve your online and cybersecurity safety. It's also hopefully going to help you improve the online safety awareness security of your students, your schools and uh, institutions that you are coming from. So very excited uh, to be part of this session and uh, looking forward to a very interactive and uh, insightful session. Amongst objectives today uh, for this particular module will be one, understanding wireless and mobile device attacks and the countermeasures uh, we can take, appreciating the attacks against software application on devices and uh, learning sites. We'll also look at learning the risk teachers and students can deliberately expose themselves or post well uh, online. Then lastly, uh, we learn the security or importance of security policies, procedures, and why we need to put them in place uh, to support uh, online learning. It's very important for, first of all, for us to identify categories of type of uh, threat actors out there. Now, these threat actors are at times called hackers. Uh, I'm using the term hackers here in a liberal sense because I know the true hackers are within the room will not be happy me categorizing and using a blanket term to categorize them with some of these guys here. So when I mention hackers, I'll mostly be focusing on or referring to cyber threat actors. So <clears throat> we have different category of threat actors or hackers and each of these category typically has a, a very specific uh, objective or specific reasons why they are doing what they're doing. And uh, knowing these categories, knowing uh, their modus operandi will help us better understand them. And as we know, you are able to build better measures, better controls when you actually understand who or what you're working with. So the first uh, threat actors uh, I want to mention are hacktivists. So hacktivists typically promote political or social agenda. They will, in most cases, target government and uh, non-governmental organizations, corporate or even private individuals who are opposed to 
their way of thinking or their political agenda. Uh, one of the biggest or most infamous activist group is actually Anonymous. Apart from activists, we have uh, cyber criminals. Now, cyber criminals hack for profit. Activists rarely and not don't necessarily hack for profit. For them, it's all about promoting their political or social agenda. Cyber criminal, on the other hand, uh, will do so. In most words, even going a step further to even target parents anything that they can lay their hands on sell it uh, for profit uh, for profit and one of one emerging thing that cyber criminals are currently doing is also launching ransomware attacks against schools uh, in order for schools to actually pay them for them to get their information back moving on we also have a nation state actors now nation state actors are don't want to call them cyber criminals, but they work on behalf of governments. So they are not working directly for profits, but whatever they are doing will be motivated or directed by a governmental entity. Now, nation state actors can at times come off as cyber criminals. They can also at times come off as a hacktivists. Now, the reason why you'll find them swing between all this group is that their main objective is to promote what the government wants. So at times the government might be supporting a different agenda, which is backed by hacktivists, in which case those nation state actors will be under hacktivists. At times, what the government might be engaging in might be criminal, in which case they will be uh, they will be a cyber criminal. So a good example is that uh, it just came to light that uh, the North Korea government was behind a very big uh, cyber attack that happened uh, a few months back. The attackers who were part of that attack were acting as actors, uh, but in this case, whatever they were doing was actually hacking for profit. In this case, they could be loosely considered as a, a cyber criminals. Now we know globally from an education uh, sector, we have government organization trying to regulate police, a lot of content that our schools are consuming, students are consuming, depending on a lot of uh, biasness. Now in such case, state uh, nation state actors can actually be used to influence such hacktivists, especially if the government sponsoring them knows that whatever they are doing is probably going to cause a strife within that country, is probably going to cause disharmony within maybe that particular teaching community. So that's one thing to be aware of when you talk over a uh, nation search uh, actors. Then we also have insiders. Insiders we typically, in our case, in this context, teachers, students, parents, janitors, and even our support staff who actually have a legitimate access to an organization system data. So the student is required to log into whichever learning platform you are using or whichever online video conference conferencing system you're using. These can be Zoom, it can be Teams, it can be Google Meet. In certain institutions, parents also get to access or access records of their students, of their of their children in school and have access to limited school system. Adjusters. We trust them, we allow them into the office by striking hours for them to clean uh, for them just to ensure things are working as expected. All of these people have a legitimate access. Now, as insiders, it's actually easier for them to cause harm, to steal sensitive information, and even steal actual physical hardware. So when, an, when such a person acts maliciously, then they're considered as a insiders. Then we also have a cyber terrorists cyber 
terrorists can fall into cyber criminals they can fall into hacktivists the only difference is that their action will cause physical damage so for example if your school has a, a hvac system when a cyber terrorist gets access to such a system hvac here being assist uh, that whole system that helps with the uh, air conditioning so air conditioning regulating temperature and right now we know all of these systems in schools more or less are controlled uh, using it or computers a cyber terrorist can get access to that lock people in their rooms and actually increase temperatures in this case they will be causing physical uh, damage so to differentiate cyber terrorists from all these other groups always know that for cyber terrorists they actually cause a, a physical uh, damage then lastly we have cyber activists and these are generally users who use uh, the internet to promote a specific cause or bring attention to a specific issues a cyber activist will be closely related to hacktivists only difference here being that hacktivists will try to gain access to your systems will try to gain access to the school records will try to gain access to the teacher's email address to get information that will help fuel their cause cyber activists on the other hand rarely will you find them trying to compromise you or gain an authorized access most of the time think of a companies like avas where you find a course and uh, you send emails to your community you trend topics just to make more people aware of what or that specific issue and bring it to their attention now <clears throat> having known all that different types of threat actors or hackers what are they after most of the time these hackers will be after your passwords they will be after your documents they will be under your online identity and reputation they will be after your money they will be after your pictures and those moments uh, you have had with your family they will be after cyberbullying zoom bombing general access to your machine and also at times blackmail now both teachers and students one a teacher as teachers you're in a position of authority as students students at times they're in a very vulnerable position so if the if this uh, hacker is able to get your password as a teacher they are probably able to in most cases find confidential information that they can use to bully you as a teacher they can use to me you now if they get information about students and right now we know we're in that this digital age where we have people taking videos taking pictures doing voice notes so on and so forth some of this content is actually private content which you won't want out there so hackers are all about getting that information that can help them further their cause if it's for profit they know they have my pictures might say okay lawrence we are going to delete all these pictures of you unless you pay us money for a teacher if they gain access to your confidential correspondence between parents or between the, uh, with other teachers and they threaten and blackmail you that if you don't do x y and z we're actually going to leak this out to the students and the parents you see that might put you in a very compromising or uncomfortable position in which case you will be forced to give them whatever uh, they are requesting for so these are just some of the reason and uh, goals motivation for a threat uh, for, for threat actors or hackers now having understood the different type of threat actors we have having understood their motivation let's now spend the next few minutes trying to see the various advanced attacks that act hackers will typically use 
uh, to compromise you will typically use to meet or uh, as, uh, succeed in their objectives. So the first attack we should be aware of is an attack called Wi-Fi Evil Twin attack. Now, right now, <coughs> almost everyone has a smartphone or a laptop that can connect to Wi-Fi. So I know when I go to school, first thing I'm going to look for is the school Wi-Fi. It will typically have a name, for example, school Y. So I'll quickly go to my phone, search for school Y. Uh, once I find school Y, then I will be able to connect to it. With unknowingly, more or less it's, uh, people who call it, we call it muscle memory. You basically looking for a school Y is here, connect to it. Now, when you talk of an evil twin attack, what hackers will actually do is uh, they will set up a different similar network that looks like that is actually named similarly to school y so what they might do is call it school y network 2 or school y network 1 or guest network school y then once they have done this the next thing they're going to do is they're going to make it very hard for your device your laptop your tablet your computer to connect to the exact or to the legitimate school Y network. So what typically happens in such a case? You'll pick your phone, try to connect to school Y, you realize that it's not connecting, then you immediately say, ah, there's school Y network too. And as humans, we are wi wired to, to take shortcuts. I know in my mind, I'll think of, ah, maybe today at uh, the school has a lot of students, maybe exams are continuing, that's why the IT team has given us uh, school Y network 2. Then I'll connect to school Y network 2. All of this is something that the hacker has planned and trying to achieve. They know the human psychology. They know that the moment the teacher, the student, the parent can't connect to this particular network, they will look for the next network that is very similar to uh, the network they are looking for. And if they're able to connect to that network, well and good. So once now you connect to the new network we talked about, this network is being, is being controlled by the hacker. Now once connected, the hacker can now intercept and view and even steal everything you will be accessing on the internet using that particular Wi-Fi. So what can, what can they steal? They can steal your login credentials. So if you're accessing your learning management system, if you're accessing the school email address, if you're putting in a report, uh, if you are chatting with a colleague, a teacher, a parent, that particular hacker will be able to see all this information and they can weaponize this information against you. So once the attack has all this information, they will weaponize it to coerce you and help and force you to further their cause. What can you do to avoid this? One, you always want to be to avoid connecting to any unfamiliar wireless network when school, well transacting, uh, school, a business. Not only you, you need to also help other teachers know this, other students know this, and be aware that if they see an unfamiliar network, as long as it's not the standard or the normal network name or Wi-Fi they're connecting to, they should be hesitant to connect to, connect to it. Secondly, you want to avoid using public Wi-Fi. Reason being public Wi-Fi, it's public. It's not within the control of the school. It's not within the control of your IT team. Then, an additional thing you can actually do is if you are unsure if you're unsure whether this network is legitimate or not always call your IT team they will be able to inform you uh, one thing I've seen in a lot of schools uh, right now is that most schools are slowly and progressively being out of these attacks so whenever 
new Wi-Fi Wi-Fi system, so why access points are added, the school will actually communicate this to the teachers, support staff, everyone, and tell them that we have introduced a new Wi-Fi, and this is a, a, the, a, the, a, this is the name you should be aware of, so that both learners, teachers are aware of what to expect and what not to expect. The second attack we want to talk of is called a phishing attack. In a phishing attack, Taka attempts to trick you into giving away sensitive information. Now, this can be your login credentials, personal information, your teacher's number, a teacher's identification number, so on and so forth. They typically do this by disguising themselves and coming off as a people that can be trusted or are people in authority. So for example, if you are targeted in a phishing ad, the attackers will study you, go through your social media pages, go through your school profile, try to understand you as much as they can, try to understand where you're working are from. Then once they have built a profile, someone can either one or so I'll call you as a teacher, introduce myself, I tell you, Hi, John, my name is uh, so-and-so. I'm the father, the mother to James, uh, who is a student in your class. I wanted to find this additional information about James. Or if they want you to share information, they'll actually tell you that I'm taking James to a soccer meetup next week and the coach has requested for you to fill this, uh, this form. Can I send you a link? So if you're unaware, as a teacher, you're already thinking, ah, the is a parent has called me. And in most cases, that student might not even exist. It might be a, a name that is common. It also might be something that they have researched on publicly. So if the school regularly posts its activities on the internet, an attacker will actually study and research on that so that when they're calling you, it's easier for you to trust them. At times, they can impersonate a fellow teacher. They can impersonate someone from a, maybe the education ministry that probably you might not be aware, but you might have that fear that I'm talking to someone from the regulation or regulator's office. So in addition to this, at times, they'll also send you an email, message, an email or a message that appears to be from a legitimate source going to a previous example of the parent. So the parent has actually called you, told you that they have a what appears to be a genuine case and they are sending you an email. An email, And this email might have an attachment or it might be requesting for additional information. At times, they can even impersonate a student, fellow teachers, or as I've mentioned, someone from the regulator's office. All they are trying to do is solicit this additional information, typically sensitive information from you. What can you do to protect yourself? One, you can start off by simply installing an antivirus and encouraging adoption and usage of antiviruses by both your fellow teachers and students. Secondly, you should always be cautious of any unsolicited email or messages. Unsolic unsolicited emails or messages are messages or emails that you did not expect or anticipate. If you receive a mail claiming to be from your head of department, were you expecting that mail? If you're not expecting it, there's a high probability it might be a phishing mail. Then thirdly, whenever you receive this mail, you want to avoid clicking or opening any link attachments on such emails because all of these are tricks that the attacker is trying to use to ensure that they gain or get this sensitive information from you. Then always, when in doubt, call, text your school IT administration team and verify. If this unsolicited email was from a colleague, call that colleague, text the colleague, ask them, did you send me this message? And they will be able to help you uh, verify. 
So calling verification is a very simple step process that will actually help protect you from a, a way bigger issue of having to deal with stolen sensitive information or a personal information of either yourself, your fellow teachers, your students, or even their parents. I'm moving on to our third advanced attack, malicious, malicious mobile and desktop application. Now, almost everyone, most people will, you have a browser, a new computer, you will Google how to download Chrome or how to download Firefox. When you Google this, what you expect, expect is whichever platform you are using, so if you are using Edge or whichever browser you are using, is actually going to give you a legitimate link to whichever software software you want to download. Now, unfortunately, this is not always the case. Attackers have become aware of this and what attackers are right now doing is that they are paying such companies like Google, like Microsoft, to promote their links. So, for example, depending on my location, I might go to Google and tell Google I'm selling this uh, software application, I call it Firefox, and tell Google I'll pay you this X amount of money to advertise and promote this software so that if Google targets that advert to my country, which is Kenya, majority of guys who are searching for Firefox will actually see my advert first. Uh, the good thing that Google tries and most search engine will do is uh, they'll tell you when those first links are actually linked. Sponsor, sponsored links are links whereby the owner of that link has actually paid that service provider to make that link appear ahead of any other similar links. To a user who is not aware, they will search for that particular software. They see the first result. Google tells them it's a promoted, but they won't know the difference between the unpromoted and not promoted content. So what happens is they end up downloading my lookalike look -like version of Firefox from my link. I'm an actor, I'm a hacker. That Firefox is malicious and it's meant to give me access to your machine. So unknowingly, you'll download that particular application. The moment you download it, install it, you give me access to your mobile phone or desktop unknowingly. In most cases, that application is not even going to function. What happens? You will go back to Google and try to search again. Probably tell yourself, okay, maybe I've done something wrong. You go back to whichever your favorite search engine and try to search again. However, that's the mistake has already been done and now I have access to your machine. Now, if this machine is your school machine, then I have access to everything inside that particular school machine. If this was a student, the moment they download that, I will have access to that specific, uh, that specific student's device. And not only that, in most of our Facebook accounts, Facebook groups, our WhatsApp, most of us probably have come across uh, a lot of uh, advertisement of forwarded links claiming to do one thing or the other. If you are like me and you are trying to uh, watch your diet, absorb any new habits, probably you might have been targeted with a link that tells you, click here to download XYZ exercising application. Now, if you do a, a lot of research, so for example, I know one of the tool a lot of academic researchers use is uh, Mendeley. So you'll go to Men Google search for Mendeley, you get a million or a couple of links, all claiming to give you access to the right Mendeley. One of those links is probably by an attacker, just waiting for you to unknowingly download it, install it into your machine and uh, they have access. 
Now, once they have access, what can they do? Apart from all those sensitive information, if you are working on research papers, on term papers, you are also giving them this access. And we recall the cyber criminals are in for profit. And right now we are living in an age of data. Your data will always be useful to someone. And the hacker knows whatever I collect, I can always sell it out there for profit. What can you do to protect yourself? As I mentioned, your, the antivirus will always be your first line of defense. The good thing with antiviruses right now is they are able to detect and actually stop a lot of uh, these attacks. Now, one question I know <clears throat> I typically come across even in my consulting uh, work, especially when working with acad academic institution, is that there is a limited budget. So, Lawrence, you keep telling us we need to install antivirus, we need to install antivirus. But the school does not have a budget to buy everyone antiviruses. Not to worry. Most antivirus vendors will actually give you basic versions of their antiviruses. So, for example, if you are using Windows, Windows by default comes with Windows Defender. Some users disable it, but check your machine for Windows Defender and just enable it. Enable it and ensure it is updated. Windows is not, Microsoft is not going to charge you anything for that. Then we have other vendors like VG. That will still allow you to use their basic antivirus, which will protect you from at least 70% of these attacks without you having to pay anything. So always, if you can, install antivirus not only on your laptop uh, desktop workstation but also on your phone also on your tablets and not only for teachers but also encourage students to also adopt this the other thing you can do is always always download application from trusted app stores so if you're in that school, WhatsApp group, Facebook group, and other teachers are sharing files telling you this is the next best thing, avoid such. If you want to install an application, for example, if you want to install WhatsApp, go to Google Play, go to Apple App Store, just search for WhatsApp and Google will give you the right authenticated clean version of that particular uh, application. Thirdly, you want to avoid downloading applications from third-party stores and also downloading applications that are sent to you in form of attachments or messages unless, unless you completely trust whoever is sending this particular application to you on email. Then also the last thing you want to do, especially in this age of mobile devices, always check the permission requested by the app and only install application where you are happy with the permissions. I'll give you a very interesting case I got to work on recently. <coughs> so I come from a family where 90% of my siblings are actually teachers. So one of them actually received uh, a mobile application via the teacher's WhatsApp, uh, WhatsApp, one of those teacher's WhatsApp forums. Very happy, like I've been looking for this application, now I have it. She went ahead and knowingly, it... then five minutes after she installed the application, I started getting messages from her. XYZ has been hacked by XYZ. So I call her, like, why am I getting SMS from your phone that you have been hacked? For her, she was oblivious, like, my phone is okay. I've not been hacked. So when you are doing additional investigation into that, we actually realize that this application she installed, claiming to help other teachers achieve certain objectives, was actually going through your contact list and sending 
premium messages to everyone in there in your contact list so imagine right now if you have a thousand users in your contact list this application will actually send premium messages to all those a thousand users reason i'm saying this is premium is that for each message it's sending the attacker is getting a small fraction commission for each message that is sent. so imagine this was one teacher infected and this was a group with almost 200 teachers imagine the amount of money that particular threat actor made and this was even in my opinion better some application will actually go through your gallery pick all the pictures in your gallery and send them send them out to the attacker then the attacker goes through all that and they're able now to blackmail you i know as teachers even as adults you have private content that you might not be comfortable someone else gaining access to that now imagine someone threatening you as a teacher that if you don't pay me this x amount of money i'm going to send this to your school i'm going to send this to parents and this has actually been known to happen not only to teachers but to even our leaders and you have had leaders actually resigning uh, and leaving office because their private content was accessed by someone simply downloading an application from an, uh, an unverified source an, an, an unverified uh, source then moving on we have talked of malicious mobile and desktop application now malicious uh, documents <coughs> Part of what I do is research and uh, at times research require a lot of funds. So it's always a sigh of relief if a grant that or a research body that uh, you are applying to, it's always a, a relief when a grant or a research body you're applying to gets back to you telling you that uh, Lawrence received your application and uh, we are happy to work with you. Rarely some will even just reach out to you because of uh because of recommendation so maybe you're working with another researcher apologies if my screen keeps disappearing at uh, technical issues or also this might be one of those advanced cyber security attacks yeah i was just talking about and i might have installed a malicious uh, application so i just talked about malicious mobile and desktop application now what you've actually seen my screen hopefully you didn't see it but what was happening when you had that pause was that my screen was flickering on and off and from research I've, i know that these are attacks that have actually been targeted at times at teachers learning institution especially during that covid period where a lot of organizations are going online uh, people malicious actors hackers are taking advantage of this and sending guys links to help you with that all online learning and they install a malware in your system just to make your life hard periodically it will switch your screen off once in a while just to be a nuisance so all of that is still malicious mobile and desktop application uh, when we talk of malicious document coming back to the grant so with malicious documents you receive in most cases unsolicited but legitimate looking document mostly via email so in this case may be applied to a grant then a week later a month later i get a response but claiming to be from that particular organization it will be a document probably telling me that okay lawrence this this is the application form kindly fill these at times i've seen where you actually even sent an application that you need to install tell okay once you have finished populating this document install this application to access our portal now as a teacher the moment i see ah it's a grant my guard will automatically go down and in high probability i will be able to download that in most cases a word document or a 
PDF document. It doesn't need to be grants. It can also be documents claiming to be even from students. So a student, someone claiming to be your student, mailing you and telling you, good evening, sir, madam, this is uh, my report submission or this is my class assignment submission. And, uh, you know, as teachers, you are receiving a lot of these reports, a lot of this submission. So at times it's actually muscle memory. You will pick it, uh, probably don't, uh, you can't tie down the name of this particular student. In most cases, you'll actually tell yourself, ah, probably I forgot it or maybe I'm tired, but you'll still click it, download it, open it and knowingly you install malware. So why we call this malicious document is that this word document, this Excel document, this PDF document, it might appear genuine. However, it has malicious code. It has code that once you open that document will give access to the attacker, will give the attack access to your devices. And once they have this one, always they're able to steal information, they're able to install malware, they're able to launch further attacks and even at times if there's a student doing this real story i know when i was doing my uh graduate studies thank god the professor allowed us to do this a, a group of students were actually able to submit their reports after uh, the required period was done by basically tricking the ins the professor into reading a maldoc they had sent him for a totally different thing and the moment the professor was doing this got access to his machine without the professor knowing and they uploaded that particular assignment past the submission now and the professor never was never where at the particular time we all got to know this or the professor only got to know this during the debrief when guys were sharing the different attacks they used that particular classwork of that particular uh, project. So as always, what can you do? Antivirus. You, sh you should or you should encourage yourself included adoption and utilization of uh, antiviruses. A uh, big cautious whenever you are opening email attachments, clicking on links from unknown uh, sources, including also Non sources, as long as it's an email that is unsolicited, you want to be cautious of it. Then, lastly, you always want to your software and operating system updated. Then, as we come to end of this uh, advanced attack, that one at attack I mentioned was the inside attack, where a legitimate person has access to your machine, they use that access to mine your security, where this inside attack teacher student or janet, uh, janitor so for example as i mentioned janitors have access to most of uh, the school offices nothing stops them from coming to the staff room plugging in a usb into your device getting your password and copying contents into that particular flash disk nothing stops them from taking pictures of documents that are lying on on your desk going to teachers and students it's been known documented that at times teachers and students will share or even sell confidential school materials, examination records, materials to students or teachers from other institutions, or just sell it out there for profit. Uh, also, students as insiders can also share their access to this learning platform, share this access to other schools or other students who might not have paid or who might be having issues, financial issues, disciplinary issues uh, with the school. Uh, inside attack are some of the most complex and challenging attacks to actually uh, to actually stop uh, when you compare them with these other attacks. But as an instructor, what can you do? Or as a school, what can you do? One, always conduct background checks on teachers, janitors and support staff so in cyber security we have one common saying that one trust people but verify 
So conducting background checks is not, you're not doing it in bad faith. It's not being done because you don't trust the teachers. You're basically doing due diligence and verifying a few things here and there. Secondly, you want to implement strict access controls. So what strict access controls here means is that your workstations, your laptops need to have passwords. If you have a desk office, you need to have drawers that can be locked so that once you're done with school, you put all your documents in there and actually lock and go with the key. Then providing and training and giving awareness to both students and teachers, support staff on importance of data protection and security best practice. So with that, I would like to come to the first end of this, where we have basically gone through types of attack, uh, hackers, their motivation, and some of those advanced uh, attacks that we see out there targeting teachers. In the next few minutes, I would like to spend time on briefly doing a demo, three demos. Uh, the first demo will be how attackers use social engineering and phishing to steal student or teachers your social media passwords. Second demo will be how can attackers still using social engineering learn or steal your password for the learning management system. And this can also be systems like Zoom, Teams, or Google Meet. Then the last demo will be how attackers can use documents to gain access to your devices. So what you're seeing in front of me or in front of you in this case is a tool go called GoFish. So GoFish is a security tool that hackers also use to, to design and uh, share or send you all these phishing mail. So I won't go into the technicalities of this. So I'll start off with the first demo, which will be stealing Facebook passwords. So what a tool like GoFish does is it allows you to send any mail you want to whichever people you want to work with. So I'll, I'll also briefly touch base on that. So in the background, what has been done is I've sent a mail to dummy teachers and uh, these teachers are going to receive this mail. They're going to be told to click on a link and when they click on that link, I will be able to get the password. So this mail had already hit my inbox. As you can see, we have a mail with the subject suspicious account login. Most of us, when you see this particular mail, when you see such a mail claiming has all the hallmarks of coming from Google, you'll, you'll be concerned like, who is trying to access my email? So you will quickly go through it. It At this point here, it basically tells you that uh, if you don't recognize what, if you don't recognize this activity, click here, then your account is about to be hacked. What do you do in Hest? You will actually click on that particular link. So you see uh, there is an error there. No, not to worry. You will actually click on that particular link. And when you click on such a link, what happens in the background is that the attacker is able to collect your details. I'm hoping I will be able to show that in a few. So once you enter those details, if I come to back my my tool here, once you enter those details, what the attacker will be seeing in the background will be something like this. So this tool will tell them, okay, four mails were sent, one email has been opened, one email, the user clicked on that link, at the link being this link right here, click here. Then it will also tell them that one user has submitted this particular data. And right here we can see this user, Alex, who is a parent, has submitted data. If I click on this link, I will be able to see multiple fields. The field I'm interested in is submitted data. And when I go to view details, I will be able to see the email that this particular teacher entered. So teacher at Facebook, I will be able to see the password they actually entered and with this information now i will actually have access to either depending on the attack either their 
Facebook account or their Google account. And now I can go ahead and actually log into those platforms uh, on their behalf. The second attack I wanted to show you is an attack where the actor tries to steal your information for the learning management system. If you see, so you can see here, this mail is coming from the IT support team. Welcome back to school, fall semester. So it tells you, dear Alex, welcome back to school. It even goes ahead and gives you your right email address. And we tell you that if you have forgotten your email address, just click here. And when you click on that link, it presents you a link that looks like the blood blackboard learning system, which is being controlled by the attacker. Remember in the phishing mail, we said of don't click on links, don't click on uns unsolicited email. So in this case, there is a link you have clicked. You're assuming it's from your IT team. Then you go ahead and enter your email. So I'll say test and enter password, say maybe strong password. Call it password XYZ. So I'll just enter any random characters. And here, I'm very sure I'm actually working with the actual system. Then once I'm done, I will click on login. Then when I actually click on login, what the system will do is it sends the information to the attacker, then takes me to the right blackboard for my school. So this is the right blackboard for my school. What we just clicked on here, if I could show, this one here is controlled by the hacker. How do you know it's controlled by the hacker? If you look one at the URL, recall you are always told, look for the padlock. This padlock here, if I hover my mouse here, tells me connection not secure. If I come to the right one, the padlock, I'm told verified by Amazon, it does not have that red tick right there. So those are some ways to, you can easily know these are, uh, know that probably this is not something that uh, something that is uh, legitimate. Recall we entered our information here. If we go back to our tool, so I'll go to campaigns. We look for that particular campaign, stealing credentials on LMS. If we look at the results, and we look what Alex has done, we'll see the details just entered right now. We can see the login ID he entered was test, which I did, and we can actually see the password. With this information, if this was the right information, then the hacker will actually gain access, know my credentials, and go ahead and access this particular particular platform as me. So if this was you as a teacher, that hacker has access to your learning management system or your Zoom, uh, your Zoom information. And then lastly, in the interest of time, let's look at the last email. In this email, we have received a mail from Rhodes Scholarship. It tells me, dear Alex, a Rhodes a Scholarship has opened its application portal. They're extending a personal invite to make me feel very special, to trick me and lower my guard then they go ahead and tell me that they have attached a setup to access the application portal and the applica application form to be uploaded on the portal. And indeed, if I look right here, I see that there is a form that has been attached for me. So what can I do right here? can click on this form, I download it. Then once I've downloaded it, I can go ahead and actually open it. So let me close this because I'd already opened the form. So if we go to the form that we actually had, so I click on the word document. Once I click on it, this is all I see. So 
a Rhodes Trust doesn't seem suspicious. However, in the background, let me see if I'm actually able to show you uh, what's happening uh, in the background. So in the background, what is happening is that the mere fact that I open this form means that the attacker has access to my machine. And how do we know the, how do you know this? The machine I'm using here, let's assume it's the teacher's machine. This is the teacher's machine. The attacker does not have access to this particular machine. If I go to my desktop here, I'm able to see the document I downloaded. If I go to my documents here, I can see I have some secrets here. Okay. Uh, pictures in Bali, password. I can also see I have class reports. All of these, as a teacher, I'm assuming I'm the only one who is able to access this information. Now, as a hacker, the hacker in the background is seeing something like this. Now, uh, this is a what we call a terminal. It might not make a lot of sense for a start, but in most cases, this is what the attacker is seeing. The, if the attacker is seeing this, the attacker already has access to your machine. So to prove us, if I try to list the content, then before I do that, if I try to list the content, I'm actually now able to see the content of this particular machine. So I, I can see that the documents I'm looking at are in the folder called Documents Schoolwork Exam. So if this is a student, if this is a malicious actor, I will be interested, okay? I see same one exam, uh, same one exam biology with answers. If this was a national exam and I'm a hacker, definitely what I'll do is actually download this file. So I'll go ahead and select this file. and download it and now it's downloaded into my machine which is different so the teacher's machine is here and what i'm using now i'm working as a hacker and uh, working on my machine so this document has been downloaded into this directory and now if i go to that directory i think i'd already opened it here i can actually see that particular document what else can we do as the hacker i can still navigate and try figure out what is also in this a uh, teacher's uh a teacher's computer i see class reports can navigate to class reports i see we have jones mary's okay can i introduce a, a different report maybe my own report definitely remember as the hacker now what we do is uh, we have total access on this machine and it's very simple i can create my own document let's see if we have actually a document here i see john let's see if we can do john a favor and upload this report so what i can do is basically upload and specify john report so I'll copy the name. And that report has been uploaded. The, the, the teacher will go to his folder and will wonder, okay, ah, John's, I don't recall downloading it, but he won't have a way of figuring out. So this is how hackers can actually access your machine straight from starting off from a basically that particular word document we opened and lastly attackers can go and do more and even remotely share your screen so let me bring this screen somewhere else what you are seeing is a screen share of that teacher's machine or that particular student's machine so whatever they do 
the attacker is able to see the attacker is able to record so these are some of those uh, advanced attacks that you ideally want to be aware know what hackers able to do and ensure you are putting in all those relevant control so one of the control to actually put in here is antivirus uh, if we had time i'll have actually shown you but in my work machine my personal machine this attack failed it failed because my antivirus was actually able to capture this remove that offending uh offending what document and tell me that this document is actually uh, infected so as we wrap this up and i hand this over back to uh patricia i will just try see if i can showcase what i just mentioned it is so recall the email we saw because i'm using an antivirus and i'm using outlook the antivirus was actually able to tell me that this road scholarship is a virus and it even removed that offending uh, word document. As you can see, I can see the text, but I can't see that particular word document, which in essence has actually protected me as a student, protected the teachers, protected the school from all of this information are being stolen. Then with that, I would like to come to an end and I hope uh, the last few minutes you have been able to learn a few things. Just to recap, type of attackers we have, their motivation, how they compromise our systems, and you have actually been able to see an actual demonstration of how hackers go about this and the defenses you can put in place. Thank you so much and I hand this back to Patricia. Uh, thank you so much, Lawrence, for that informative uh, session. I believe uh, we've all learned a lot in terms of um, advanced cyber attacks and you've seen some of them in action um, to be able to understand or rather to put into perspective just how exactly hackers are able to orchestrate these attacks. Um, we do not have much time for questions, but I would just want to ask one which is related to the demos um, that you've just done, Lawrence. So the question is uh, regarding the demos being displayed um, by the presenter, how do they even gain access to my email and manage to send those links when my Gmail is secured? So how attackers get access to your email is by basically sending you that initial mail via social engineering and strategy called phishing. They are trying to bait you, send you an email that you can relate to. So I mentioned if you're into research, they're sending you mails about research opportunities. If you're into any other activities, sending you relevant mail to just have you click out of human curious to click and open that. And that's all what attackers require. The initial entry, they are not even stealing your password unless it's a link where, as we saw with Blackboard, where you are clicking on a different link and entering your password. For the mail, for the attachment, they only require you to read and open that particular attachment. Now, based on your email provider, some email providers like Gmail are very proactive and they will flag such such emails and put them in your spam folder and actually tell you that this mail has been reported as uh, malicious other main clients as you saw in my example won't be able to flag that and uh, they put you at risk that's why you add that additional control over introducing an antivirus a solution maybe you could also quickly mention what antivirus you use there are questions around uh, which one you use because you mentioned that uh, your antivirus flagged it so maybe you can mention that i actually use a uh, avg the free version specifically for this lab and that free version was actually able to pick this mail so when you install avg i just ensure you're also giving it the privilege to also scan your email address and not only your system or flash drive. 
let it also scan your the mails coming to your machine all right thank you um also on the questions about where attackers get your emails um a lot of times we share our emails publicly when we are registering for accounts and uh, signing up for different social media platforms and um, attackers have tools that they can use to kind of harvest these emails. For example, on LinkedIn, where we share a lot of our emails so that people can reach us. Reach us. Um, so th that is why it's very important to understand protecting yourself and understanding that um, they are phishing emails and to verify before you trust something. So I think that is something that I saw a lot in the chat. Um, people saying, um, verify, don't just blindly trust things. There are a lot of questions around um, whether these slides will be shared. Yes, the recording, the presenter's uh, presentation, all will be shared. And if your question is not answered here, We'll also send a document, an accompanying document with all these questions answered in a very uh, simple manner. And if there's still something you do not understand, you can reach out to us via um, email or via the Telegram group. For those who are asking about the Telegram group, uh, we do have uh, the, the email or rather the invitation was shared to you via email. So please just check your email and check um, Telegram group, you'll be able to find the link there. You can also find it under announcements on the Mookit um, app or the Mookit website. You'll be able to find it under Telegram. So um, I'm really sorry we could not answer more questions because our time is running out, but those will be answered um, as we share the presentation. Thank you so much, Lawrence, for the presentation and for the informative session. I think everyone in the chat agrees with me that it was very informative. There's much to learn. And when we share the recording, please feel free to go back through it and uh, maybe go through the demos again, just to understand the different nuances of these attacks. And I believe you'll be able to learn a lot. Uh, just before we go, um, we did want to share a bit about the certification criteria because a lot of us are asking about uh, how they're able to get uh, to get certificates. I don't know what part of my screen you're seeing. Are you able to see the the certification tracking? Could someone confirm for me? Ah, yes, Patricia. Yes, yes, we can. Oh, perfect. Um, so you asked about how to know that you'll get a certificate and we mentioned in the in the webinar in the very first webinar the orientation webinar that there are two certificates we have a certificate of completion and we have a certificate of participation and for these two certificates you receive one or the other you don't receive both of the certificates so as you can see one is higher meaning you performed better uh, than the people who will get the certificate of participation. Uh, so for certificate of completion, you do need to score 60% and above in all the quizzes. So this is the tracking for week one, so that you know what you need to have done for this specific week in order to get a certificate of completion. So you need to have done at least two of the activities. Uh, so in week one, there are three activities, 1A, 1B, and 1C. Please make sure you have at least attempted one, um, two of these three. And by attempting, we mean that you have actually done the activity and you've responded to that particular forum. It is only marked that you have contributed when you respond to the forum. And then we had two quizzes at one module assessment. So for week one wireless and mobile device attacks quiz, you need to have scored at least 60% and above. And same applies to the software application quiz and the module assessment. So you need to score 60% in all. And then for certificate of um, participation, you need again to have participated in two of the activities and you need to have scored at least 50%. So for example, if you score 40% in one of these, you would not get a certificate at the end. So just go through your progress. Um, I believe we showed how to look at your progress. It's under your profile. 
So click on profile and look at the progress, um, your, your results under the quizzes, just to see how well you've scored. Look at um, the forums you have, or the, the topics you have contributed to, and it will tell you whether you are eligible for a certificate. So we'll do this every single week, uh, just to show you what you need to have done during that specific week, just to make sure that you do get a certificate. I do hope that that is clear. Uh, that is clear for everyone. Should you have questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to us and we'll be able to answer them. Uh, so once again, uh, thank you so much for making the time and for extending the time as well uh, to be here till the end. We really do appreciate you. We will share all these um, the, we'll share the webinar recording as well as this, as the presenter slides with you and uh, to appreciate Mr. Lawrence for being here as well and for uh, heeding to the call and giving us um, a lot of information during this session. I believe all of us have enjoyed it and uh, do have a lovely rest of your day as well. Uh, thank you very much. Good evening.